What's going on, everyone? It's your host, Costa G, again with another episode of the MSU WMA podcast. My guest today is Paul Pradell. Paul is the owner of and advisor at an RIA based in Seattle. Paul is also a graduate of Michigan State University, where he studied a few different social sciences. This was a great conversation, and it's especially geared towards students outside of traditional business programs who may be considering a career in advising. Stay tuned. Okay, welcome, Paul. Um, so I want to just start with taking us through your background. I know you graduated from MSU, um, and then now you are you own your own financial advising firm. So can you kind of just take us through your your journey to where you are now? Yeah, how far do you want me to start with uh, graduation or or during my studies? Yeah, I mean, back to, I mean, I guess undergrad would be great because a lot of our listeners are are uh, undergraduates right now, so. I, I, I'm thinking they can kind of visualize themselves in your shoes. So like many students, I came to MSU unsure what I wanted to do. There are those students who arrive and they clearly know what they want. I think there's quite a few who come and outside of high school aren't sure what they want. I certainly fell into that category. I actually started out as an accounting major and quickly came to realize that wasn't for me, um, like early in my freshman year. And, uh, and then I was uncertain, but on a large college campus such as Michigan State, you start to get exposed to other classes than your core studies like high school. And it was a full intro to philosophy class that got me real excited. And uh, um, I ultimately uh, went into the College of Social Science in a program at the time that was called a multidisciplinary degree. I think they have something by a different name now, but in effect, I left Michigan State with a degree with an emphasis on philosophy, uh, anthropology, and psychology. And, um, and then still, like a lot of students, you know, is that c coming to the end of senior year, oh, this is coming to an end. What am I, what am I want to do? And, and, uh, and, and, and I ended up coming into the financial services industry. And, um, my introduction there, if that's what you'd like to know. Um, so like many students, I was unsure what I wanted. I it definitely was not the, hey, I know I wanna be a financial planner and I wanna build a practice. And that wasn't it. It was an uncertainty as to what I wanted to do. And uh, my stepfather uh, was an early financial planner. He was the president of what was the International Association of Financial Planning, which was like a precursor to the College of Financial Planning. Um, he started a brokerage firm in Detroit, and through his partner, they were introduced to this new focus of, college, of financial planning, which excited them. I believe my stepfather was one of the first CFPs hmm. in the state of Michigan, and he ultimately created a broker dealer and caring for me, and I have a great deal of respect for him. As college was winding down and I was still uncertain what I wanted to do, there was a few things I was tossing around. He sat down with me one day and started to ask me some questions and and he didn't steer me so much as uh, he caused me to really think. And through that conversation, uh, I agreed that I would take a further look at the career. Yeah. So my next question on here is, did you always know you wanted to be an advisor? And obviously, from what you just <laughs> said, I would guess no. So I'll ask you this instead. So do you feel that your background in those in sociology um, anthropology and, and that sort of those sort of more um, philosophy yeah right yeah and do you feel like that um, or I guess my question is how do you use that sort of in your financial planning um, when you're working with clients because as we all know it's 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 more of a it's more personal than finance I have friends that have a finance background and run successful businesses I have friends with a finance background and don't run very successful financial planning practices. Um, I have friends from all different, you know, we don't, at, at this point, we're not, we don't talk about our, our educational path that got us here. I've been doing this for 28 years. Frankly, Costa, if I backed it up further, I'd say, and I wrote about this recently on a LinkedIn post, I learned an awful lot about customer service and treating people well when I was a paper boy and when I was cutting lawns in Metro Detroit and shoveling people's driveways. Mm. So my course of study 
um, by no means, um, uh, I don't feel that there was any um, uh, setback in coming in not having a business degree. By no means am I saying that someone shouldn't have a finance degree. I think the reality of the financial services industry is being customer centric and wanting to take care of your client. And regardless of what your educational background is, you could have a finance degree, but not really be very focused on wonderful customer service. And I think the degree would only take you so far. Right. Um, so for me, I feel like my background, if anything, I feel is enriching because the idea of a liberal arts study and a diverse liberal arts study afforded me the opportunity to read things I never would have read. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and in many ways, I think some of the things I learned in philosophy and psychology are really uh, come in quite handy during the course of the day and talking to clients and being in tuned and reading between the, the lines and reading the nonverbal communication that people have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And that's really in line with a lot of our guests. Um, you know, a common question we ask them is, what would you change if you could go back to college? And a lot of them say, uh, definitely take a psychology class. I would definitely take some sort of, you know, um, some classes where I learn about how humans interact and how people interact with each other. So that's right in line with what we've heard on previous episodes for sure. Um, so I want to- Yeah, go oh, ahead. I'm sorry. No, you go, you go. I was just going to say, of course, I'd be biased. I only know what I know. Right. And, and again, I have friends who I have deep admiration for that run really fabulous practices that have a business degree, um, but I also know people that that don't that also run fabulous practices. And um, you know, to the question of what would you change? Well, I feel fortunate I have those because mm -hmm. when you come into the career, as I did, then you learn as you go. Mm -hmm. um, um, and, and so, and and in regards to changing, by no means does this sound like there wouldn't be things I would do differently. Um, because of course there's always like there's that fork you wish you had taken a left turn as opposed <laughs> to a right turn. But I, I actually don't spend a whole lot like people ask me, don't you wish you had started your own firm earlier than than when you did? It, you know, re, I don't have any regrets. Um uh, I did what I did along the way and and the results have been uh, beyond my expectations. Absolutely. So while we're on that topic, um, my next question here is what made you want to go out and start your own firm? Well, maybe it was because when I was a kid, those jobs I had cutting lawns required me to be on top of it. No one called me delivering the newspapers, whether it rained or snowed, I was still doing it. And I realized it might sound a little funny, but I feel very strongly that those things instilled in me that entrepreneurial spirit. And it isn't that I didn't have jobs uh, working, but I liked one of the things when my stepfather brought this to my attention and because he owned an independent broker dealer, the reps associated with his firm were independent advisors running their business through his broker dealer. Um, I think that independent spirit was always there. And, it, and it's not to badmouth the firm I was with, but the firm I was with was became a publicly traded company. There was product and management. And I frankly felt management was more bureaucratic than actually, I don't think many of them were good financial planners. Right. Um, there was a lot of rules about how many clients I needed to bring in over a period of time and how much product I had to sell. And I started going, I didn't start going. I almost immediately thought, wait a minute, who, who am I, who's my client? Right. Um, and so um, that sweater didn't fit me after a while. And while I learned a lot, uh, it was very clear to me that I wanted to be outside of those expectations that other people had to define what a successful practice would look like. Right. I wanted to be the person to define what my successful practice would look like. Right. And and that's interesting too, that you call that all the way back to jobs you had as a kid. So that's always just kind of been underlying there. And it's always been something that you, you know, has been in the background and you, you would possibly get into, right? It's, it's not knowing yeah, I, I, um, I actually think it's a great disservice to young people that there aren't those, those opportunities like a paper boy. And right. I'm, not, I'm not trying to kid around. I'm very, very grateful that I had those opportunities. I mean, I was 11 years old 
and I would have to knock on someone's door, an adult, and ask them for money. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, talk about something that could be intimidating. And right. there were some, you know, some people, some of the people were not scary people, but intimidating. You're a little kid. And anyways, kind so of I guess funny. in some way that transferred to once I, you know, developed a practice, I, I had some of those customer service over, you know, dealing with people. Yeah, almost trial by fire a little bit too when you're younger and then you kind of develop those skills. Very interesting. Um, There's always some trial by fire even. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I want to ask about your firm specifically. So are you focused in terms of client-wise, are you focused on a specific niche or are you looking to serve one type of client in particular or are you more general, you know, as, as long as they're a good client, I'm willing to kind of take them in and have a relationship with them? Um, you know, I have clients that a a diverse group of clients that have uh, different backgrounds Mm -hmm. that, that said along the way, um, I developed a a specialty and an expertise working with people that have high concentrations of stock. Okay. And I won't say it was by design. It was meeting a client that had 60, 70% of their investable assets in their employers, publicly traded company, of course, stock, whether that was options or RSUs or ESPP, or maybe owning shares in their 401k, they had a concentration. And perhaps that psychology background and not being a bull in the China shop that I think a lot of advisors, especially early in their careers, think they're going to do is roll into town and turn something upside down. Um, I learned how to craft a strategy, respecting that the client had familiarity with the company, a sense of loyalty to the company, like an obligation to own the company, and in some cases, a written obligation, because if they're in a leadership level, um, they were obligated to own a certain amount, and I sort of fell into that, and we did really well with that. I still have that client to this day. She's been with me for about 20 years, and she introduced me to more people and more people, and so right. that really is it. Um, will, I, will I not work with someone who doesn't have a concentration? No, mm-hmm. but unlike a lot of my peers, and this isn't to knock again, different models work for different people. I've hired consultants to my practice and many of them in their toolbox have one immediate thing. And that is you have to have a minimum amount of assets, AUM to work. And that's fine if that works with an advisor. Um, my minimum is I want clients to take their finances seriously, mm-hmm. clients who want to grow, clients who see me as the expert, meaning they'll defer to me for advice and not arm wrestle us, and who are a joy to work with. Mm-hmm. Take it seriously, want to grow, let me be, do my job, and are a joy to work with. I'll take those four. Now, if they have a high asset value, that's great, but I won't trade those four for just the AUM. Right. And, I, and I'm I'm get, I'm sort of guessing here, but I, uh, maybe an educated guess that that helps your client turnover, right? So as long as they're they meet those four sort of criteria, you you you're not arguing with them on different plans or different things like that, so that they are not feeling like you're getting in the way or you're they're getting in your way, and you just have a more um, harmonious relationship. I would guess. I think I'd like harmonious is a great word, and boy, at the end of the day, if you could. Um, You know, of course, there's times um, I've often said that a great client relationship, whether it's this business or I guess you could transfer it to any other is if it's consultative, if the client's following two or three out of 10 ideas, it's probably fair to assume you're not a good fit Mm -hmm. and they should go find someone that is a fit. And to me, the client who follows seven or eight out of 10 ideas, I don't think you can expect them to follow everything. You can't control it. You can only influence the relationship seven to eight. That's a, that's, that's, that's successful. Um, So are there times where we might headbutt? Of course. Um, There are times where it's harmonious to use your word. Well, (laughs) hopefully more often than not. Hopefully more often than not. Absolutely. So I guess kind of keeping in that same vein, what are some maybe strategies you have to, um, when you're, when you are butting heads with a client to sort of diffuse the situation and, and keep the relationship moving forward. Well, and in fairness, and that's a term I use, I don't think we're butting heads. There are times what you have to respect 
like for instance, I was just on the phone earlier today with a client from Microsoft who didn't realize when he hired us that over 70% of his investable assets are in the company, in company stock. And um, that's a lot. There's a lot of, now granted, when you're at a high value, you know, an all time high on the stock, you sort of feel good that 70% of your investable assets. But let's be real, things don't necessarily stay that way. I don't think it's, I would like to hope, and I, I use the term improperly, maybe being a little lighthearted here. Um, there, there isn't a, there isn't headbutting, I guess on occasion there could be. Um, it's respecting that you're going to present to the client, like I did in this case, here are a couple ways we could attack this issue. First off, the client has to agree with you that there is an issue uh, or it or doesn't matter what your strategy is. And then it's, it's slowing it down enough to overcome objections. And I think the one thing that we have, well, one of the things we really have going for ourselves and our practice is unlike the old model and like the model all too common where the practice almost looks like a doctor's office where you get very little time with the doctor and more time in the waiting room right. and more time waiting for the doctor. I have a small nimble practice so I can spend more time with that client. I can be more patient with that client and understand that by the end of a one hour phone call, Zoom session, meeting, whatever we have, we might not get, have an agreement. They might need to sleep on it for a few days. They might come back and say, hey, can you run by that again? This is a big change for me. And, right. um, and so I think, you know, when there is head butting, uh, maybe backing up uh, between the stimulus and the response, maybe injecting a pause in between where you stop and and recalibrate what you're doing mm -hmm. uh, and try to understand, peel away from the client what it is that's causing them perhaps hesitancy to take action. You yeah. don't want, I don't think I ever want someone at the end to feel like if they were to meet a friend or their partner or their wife, husband, hey, what'd you do today with Paul? I don't really understand it, but I just did it because he told me to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We don't, we don't want that. Yeah, absolutely. And and the other thing too is I think when for you, when you're doing good work for your current clients, they're much more likely to refer you to their friends and they say, hey, this guy does great work. You got to come work with them, right? You'd sure like to hope so. I mean, that's the <laughs> idea right. that when you have a great experience, conversely, when you have a bad one, yeah, you know, people tend to be loud. For instance, I don't know many people that talk super positively about their Comcast cable service experience. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's but I'm not joking. Personal, All right. What's that? Much less personal. I just divorced myself from Comcast and <laughs> went to YouTube TV and I couldn't see. be, was actually took pictures of when I unplugged the devices before I took them all back. It was a happy day. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I, I we really pride ourselves on that. Um, and we all do things that we can improve upon. And I've listened to some of your other podcasts by some great advisors doing wonderful things. You know, there's many different ways to, to do this. Yeah. That was part of why I wanted to leave Costa, the firm, because their way, I remember telling the management team, hey, you have a sweater and it's made a nice fabric and it's even a nice color, but it doesn't fit me. Yeah, for sure. And the approach I took was I wanted to practice unlike that doctor's office where you're hardly seen. Mm -hmm. And the doctor's probably preparing for him or herself outside the examination room five minutes before you get there. Um, we have a much, uh, uh, we have a strong customer service model and an awful lot of time dedicated to each person again. So when those headbutts happen and those areas of disagreement, we can try to figure out how to move forward. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to kind of switch gears a little bit. Um, most of our listeners are, like I said, undergrads um, looking to kind of get into the industry. Um, and I want to ask you what, what, maybe one or two pieces of advice. I know we kind of touched on some stuff earlier, but what, what pieces of advice would you give to maybe newly graduated students or undergrad students, hopefully from MSU, um, that are looking to break into the industry? Well, I did this, um, and actually I've talked to just a couple of students just in the last two or three weeks. I can't emphasize enough, go do some informational interviews with people. And being a father of two, one who's a college senior and one who's a recent graduate, COVID only makes things harder. I think 
setting up some informational interviews to really understand the career path and respecting the fact that those different models have their merits. I'm not here to say the, the boutique small shop is the way, it's just the way for me. Mm -hmm. There are wonderful large firms out there. I think it would, um, the independent model probably is seen less by the student because the student, I'm assuming, is more likely to know the name of those bigger firms. I would make a point of talking to a couple independent advisors and talking to a couple large branded firms and get a feel yeah. for what it is you, he or she, Spartan, of course. <laughs> I'll talk to other students too, by the way, because I this career is so rewarding. Yeah, that's it's true. truly so fantastic. Of course, my bias is to Michigan State. <laughs> um, and, and those students I told you I talked to are, are fellow Spartans. But that's where I would start. I would do some informational interviews, talk to some advisors at different models, and, and start to get a feel for what the career is like. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, and maybe ask those advisors what they like about their model and what they might want to do differently. And you never know if that advisor, look, there's an aging advisor issue going on right now. Yeah. And I'm young at heart, but, and I'm only 54, I've got a ways to go, but I need to find someone that'll eventually want to take this practice over. Yeah, right. Um, and there's an awful lot of Unfortunately, more men than women. I think this practice needs to bring in young, uh, this business, this industry needs to attract young people who are passionate about this, who want to grow. Uh, and I also think there's a disproportionate number of men in the field, and I'd love to see more women come into the business. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of great, actually, and that you mentioned that there's a lot of great resources. We've got a couple podcasts with some some women advisors that are doing some good things. Um, Blair Ducanet is one of them. She works with Nina O'Neill um, and they're doing some good things, reaching out to younger women, looking to get them into the field. The other thing too is, you know, a lot of times, you know, um, I've read and, and listened to some podcasts that one of the, uh, you know, workarounds of that is, A, not a lot of women are interested. But I think even more than that, you have to go out and look in other industries and sort of pull women from those industries, maybe that have uh, transferable skills into the industry. So, you know, there's ways, there's definitely ways to do it. And hopefully the next generation is, is on that train for sure. Well, how about this Costa? I had a, so I've been guest speaking in uh, some financial literacy courses and I am tremendously proud that Michigan State I talked to Steve Scheitzel just a week ago. I'm so psyched that there's a minor in financial planning, but yep. I'm also happy that there's a college of social science program or classes that are, I don't remember the names, the numbers, HS something that are financial literacy. Yep. Um, and I've guessed, been a guest speaker, both in person and, and then with COVID via Zoom for the last handful of years. Well, I did some in, in uh, this last spring and then also this past fall. Well, one of those students had a, a project for a summer class that she was taking last summer and she needed to interview someone in the financial services business. So she reached out to me. She then reached out to me two weeks later going, I never, I was only doing this because it was the assignment, but now I want to learn more about the career because maybe, and remember, keep in mind, I was that guy who started in, in, in accounting, then switched to telecommunications. I didn't mention this, but I dropped out for five years, worked in the film industry in Hollywood before coming back to Michigan State to graduate. Still unsure what I wanted. And since then, she and I now have had probably four or five phone calls and I've put her in touch with some other advisors that she can go interview. So yeah, that's awesome. To your answer your question to young people, I would be open, open to this. It's such an exciting career and it's a very rewarding one. So. Yeah, absolutely. And we're really working. Um, I know we just had a podcast release with, I think the woman who teaches that class um, that you that you spoke to. Emily? Yeah, yep, yep. So, and we've had a, actually a couple of first students in our meetings recently. So we're definitely doing our part, I would say, or, or doing our best to do our part. There's three professors um, running that and they're all fabulous. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I wanted to kind of give you um, a little space here to maybe touch on anything before we wrap up that we didn't get to that you were hoping we would or anything, any fi final kind of comments you have. You know what I got to tell you, Costa, you got me. That's the, a question that I 
like to ask people at the end of an interview? What question haven't I asked? Yeah. Because it's really thought provoking and you've, I guess what I would say is, um, well, I, there's a handful of things. As a student, before you leave Michigan State, take some classes and some other stuff, maybe take a philosophy class. I talked to a yeah. student, I talked to a student uh, who's a wrestler, a fabulous guy, uh, just two nights ago, and he was telling me he's taking 18 credits. He's going to graduate with like 150 credits because he just wants to learn. Yeah, cool. And and I'll tell you to the fellow Spartans, you know, um, take a class in another course. Now, granted, to your seniors, this is their last semester. So to those, congratulations early. And I'm so sorry that they don't have the commencement, much like my daughter, who's a senior. To those who are really interested in this practice, I, I think the emphasis or the something to maybe add to is 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 embrace the idea that unlike maybe some other fields this one can be very diverse mm -hmm. you can be a teammate on a large group practice where your role is more specific to a silo and you're the uh investment manager you're the research analyst you're the uh the forward-facing advisor Conversely, you can have just as successful, just as impactful of a practice by being someone who wears multiple hats like I do mm -hmm. and have a more boutique uh, or a more boutique practice. Um, and I think that's one of the things that's so neat about this is to that entrepreneurially spirited individual, you can you can carve this thing out the way you want to. And yeah. to your wonderful question about do I have a niche or not, which I do. There's other people who are generalists that are fabulous, just right. like there's generalist physicians and specific physicians. So um, uh, I would I would just embrace the fact this is a, a pretty, pretty interesting dynamic career. And it's certainly one with an awful lot of opportunity. Absolutely. Yeah, there's tons of ways that you can get in and, and then tons of paths that you can take for sure. So, Paul, I just wanted to thank you. Uh, this was absolutely awesome doing this interview with you. Um, I, I'm, I'm betting we we are going to convert some people over into the financial planning industry, hopefully after this. Um, so thank you again. And uh, thanks for sitting down with me. Hey, my pleasure. I think what you're doing is great. I'm so impressed that you've got this. And of course, as a Spartan, I'm particularly happy to see that it's at the campus in East Lansing. So thanks, Costa, for uh, for give, having this opportunity with me. I really appreciate you uh, inviting me on. Absolutely. If you liked what you just heard, please like, comment, and share. This is Vincent Pacillo, producer of the MSU WMA podcast. MSU WMA, or Michigan State University Wealth Management Association, is a student organization part of the Eli Broad College of Business located in East Lansing, Michigan. Our mission is to inspire and educate the next generation of financial planners. Thank you for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed it, please check out our channel on all platforms such as Spotify and Apple Podcast. And check out our social media at MSUWMA at MSUWMA.com.